Sunday morning, uh, I did a message on the distinctives of Pentecost. Now, those qualities that identify you make you different. We hear quite often in this pulpit we are a Pentecostal church. So I say to that, oh, really? It's like saying I'm a farmer, and so I have the right to say, well, where's your fruit? Where's your harvest? Where are your fields? Your orchards? Just because you own a tractor doesn't make you a farmer. In southern Illinois, they have hobby farmers. And I've run into some of these people, maybe in a nursery or something, and I run into them. And what they are, they're from the city. And they sold their homes uh, for a fortune. And they can go to Southern Illinois and you can buy acreage for maybe $1,500 an acre. And so they, uh, they'll buy 10 acres, maybe 20 acres, build a nice home uh, for maybe $140,000. And uh, they put a barn on it, <laughs> and they get a couple of goats and a pony, and they want to get their kids out of the city many times, and, uh, but they don't really grow anything or produce anything, and they call them hobby farmers. It's like saying you can hoop because you bought a pair of Air Jordans. I remember years ago, this guy back when I used to play a lot of ball, this guy used to come and he was Michael Jordan from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And he went on the court, but that's all he was. It was all clothing. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, I want to do part two on distinctives of Pentecost. How do we know what are some of the biblical hallmarks of Pentecost. And I preached on that Sunday morning about Pentecostals have passion. Uh, Pentecost is power. Really, in Acts, Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is going to you power to accomplish and power to witness. Tonight, Acts 10, verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water if they should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Father, we come tonight by the blood, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray God saturate us, fill us, God, with your power and spirit to Energize us, God. I'm praying the Holy Spirit of conviction fall once again on this nation. God, help us. Help us, God, be instruments of revival in this generation. Amen. As Pentecostals, we depend on the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, we anticipate the Spirit of God coming down visiting us. We're expecting the Spirit of God to show up in our services, in our lives, in our ministry. I tell all the song leaders over the years, I said, you must pray, and when you get up to lead singing, you have to create an atmosphere where the Spirit of God can move come down and touch people. Our faith is linked to this dimension of the Holy Spirit. 
In other words, as Pentecostals, we're expecting the Spirit of God to be active and personal in our lives. We sing that chorus, Come Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. That other old course, it's the Holy Ghost in fire and it's keeping me alive. In other words, uh, we have to position ourselves uh, as Christians. We are positioning ourselves. We are listening for. We are expecting and waiting and dependent upon the Spirit of God to be active in our lives, in our services, in our behavior, in our personality, and in our ministry. Are you Pentecostal? I've been places, sad to say, and preached, and it's like uh, the congregation, uh, they weren't expecting God to come down. They weren't even the pastors sometimes, sad to say, just want to wrap it up and, and go eat or something. We're talking about a lifestyle of faith. The Spirit of God speaking to us. Going before us. We're talking about the Spirit of God guiding us. Ordering our lives, our behavior, our language, our ministry. In other words, the Bible says we need to walk in the Spirit. The Bible says we need to live by the Spirit. Romans 8.13 For if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Do you live by the Spirit? Verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This is the battle is positioning yourself uh, to be led by the Spirit of God. I'm ministering Sunday morning. So many people battle sin. They battle the flesh. They battle temptation. They battle addictions. They battle family curses. They battle insanity and emotions. And they're trying the best. But if you just get filled and full and be led by the Spirit of God, you'd be amazed how easy it is uh, to conquer that stuff and walk away from it. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from it. And so the battle is the flesh sets itself against the Spirit and the Bible said the Spirit is against your flesh. This has to do with your mind. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, if you're going to live in the Spirit, it has to do with how you think and process life. Mentally, there's a deliberate action. You ever tell somebody, mind your own business. You're saying, you need to de de deliberately get your nose and your mind out of my business. And that's kind of like Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Uh, in other words, when we're talking about setting your mind up, uh, we're talking about mentally what you're pursuing. Are you mentally pursuing the Spirit of God? Do you run after the flesh and the desires of the flesh or do you run after the Spirit of God? That's how you walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. This has to do with how you live and move and perceive mentally and spiritually through life. Are you Pentecostal? Are you led 
Does the Spirit of God lead your behavior? Does the Spirit of God lead your decisions and your conduct? Does the Spirit of God lead your, your vocabulary and your language? It has to, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You have to set your mind on the things of the Spirit if you're going to walk in the Spirit. And that's Pentecostal. And so the big question in the battle many times uh, is how does this become real, present, and personal, and powerful? <laughs> Romans 8, 11, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it gives life through His Spirit who dwells in you. Does the Spirit of God dwell in you? To the degree the Spirit of God dwells in you is to the degree you live and walk in the Spirit mentioned last week. Everywhere you surrender to God, the Holy Spirit now has access. Everywhere you rebel, resist, fight, defend, make excuses, Spirit of God doesn't live there and <coughs> you end up living in flesh. Are you Pentecostal? Are you Pentecostal? Watching Peter as the Spirit is trying to activate and his flesh is fighting and resisting. Matthew 16, 13, very familiar. Jesus is asking, who do men say that I am? Asking his disciples. Some of them say, well, you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. He said, no, 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 I'm not, don't tell me what. I want to know who you say I am. Who do you say he is? And Peter answered, Matthew 16, 16, and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus translated, Wow, shoot, Peter, you amazing. And he makes this statement, uh, Blessed are you, Matthew 16, 17, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He said, that statement didn't come out of your flesh. What about you? He said, that came from my Father. That was a spiritual statement. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was a revelation. And this is critical, see. God by the Spirit will give you revelation to critical questions in life that have to do with your future. Jesus turns to him after this statement says, Behold, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of God. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. <clears throat> this is all linked to spirit. Walking, led, speaking. Your mind set and catches a spirit revelation. And he said, now you've got a key. you got a key here on earth Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, a spiritual host of wickedness in high places, in the heavenlies. Heavens are more than clouds. The heavenlies uh, is a spiritual climate and culture where the demonic and, and principalities and demonic activity where it rules here on earth. You can drive in some neighborhood. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, you can feel it. In some neighborhoods, you feel it, man. <clears throat> but be carrying. No, 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 don't do that. Be carrying the Holy Ghost. Amen. But you know what I'm talking about. I've been in places before, man, you can feel the vibes. Heavy vibes. I remember 
one time in the Muslim area in the Philippines, Connie and I was there. And I'm telling you, you could feel it. I mean, you could feel intense anger and violence. I said, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. And so what he's saying, though, when you walk in the Spirit, when you have this spiritual dimension, you have a spiritual key that here on earth, now you have authority to bind here, but it's not just here, it's up there. It's not just loosing here, but it's loosing up there. This can have to do with your marriage. Maybe everybody you've ever known in your family has been divorced. Or their, their marriages, you know, Jerry, Jerry, it's crazy, it's, it's Looney Tunes. And, but you don't have to. He can give you a key that unlocks and changes and looses you. Or you can bind, you can bind those demons of addiction, uh, curses of murder and death, uh, that traffic in families, curses of poverty. But you see, it's a spiritual dimension, and that's what he's telling Peter. But watch, almost the very next verse, this same Peter, Matthew now 16, 21. We went from Matthew 16, 17 and 18. Now we're at verse 21. Same chapter, same book, just a couple of verses. Jesus began to show his disciples, verse 21, that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, be killed and raised on the third day. Watch Peter. Matthew 16, 22. Peter took him aside. He takes the Lord and said, Come to where Jesus I cannot talk to you. And I don't know if he put his arm around him. He says, I, I, I need to talk to you. In the Lord. And the Bible said he began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? This Peter's a character. I mean, you're, you're talking about, you've seen him raise dead folks. I'd be hesitant about seeing people who walked on water, raise dead people, multiply the boys lunch and fed them. Wouldn't you? I mean, I'd be hesitant a bit. But the Bible said he rebuked him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. And Jesus turned to this same Peter in verse 23. Now, now remember just three or four verses before. Oh, Peter, man. God, a flesh and blood. I mean, my Father revealed this to you. Our keys of the kingdom are in our wow, 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 wow. And it's like in the blink. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful. Remember what I was saying? You're not thinking spiritually. Your mentality is wrong. You're not allowing the Holy Spirit to lead your thoughts. You're not mindful of the things of the Spirit. Now your flesh is doing the thinking. What's the matter with you, Peter? One minute revelation. The next minute, you're like the devil himself. That's so human, isn't it? You're going to have to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Uh, this is deeper than just intellect. Where's your interest? Where's your interest in life? Your heart? In your business? Sports? Hobbies? Leisure? Physical? Material world? Where's your interest? Where's your mental pursuit? I do many things over the years. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I'm a great grandfather. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. 
been a missionary, a lot of different things. But my first interest has to be God and His Spirit. My first pursuit has to be his, my relationship with Him. That's walking in His Spirit. My first concern as I make decisions, as I live life, as I speak, my behavior, my conduct, where I go, how I live life. My first inclination has to be considering my relationship with God. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. Is that true? That's Pentecostal. God has to come first. That's the mark of Pentecost. Am I right with God? I don't want anything or anyone that would interfere with my relationship with Him in the Spirit and His will for my life. That's where your mind has to live. Those who set their mind on the things of the Spirit will live in the Spirit. Those who set their mind on the things of the flesh will walk and live in the flesh. Where's your mind? Where's your interest? What moves you, excites you, turns you on? What do you always want to talk about? What excites you? Is it spiritual? That's been one of the distinctives of Pentecost. If you read about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. I will send the Spirit, Jesus said. He will not speak of Himself, but He will glorify me. So when I walk in the Spirit, or you walk in the Spirit, your life glorifies Jesus. That's Pentecost. And that's your joy. That's your pleasure in life. That my life, through the Spirit, Glorify Him. We sing that to glorify Jesus, magnify the Lord, all that stuff. Is it just a chorus? Pentecostals are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. They're known as people of the Spirit. You can't read the book of Acts without seeing on every page. The fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. Watch in our text. We have an encounter here, two chapters, Acts 10 and 11, basically, of Peter and Cornelius. They are so opposite. They are in two different worlds. One is a Gentile, the other is a Jew. One is a fisherman, the other is a Roman centurion soldier of the Italian reg regiment. What brought them together was Pentecost, the Holy Spirit as an agent. They live in two extreme spectrums, different spectrums of life. Jew, Gentile, fisherman, soldier. Italian dance in three. What's the Holy Spirit work? What's the Spirit speaking? Acts 10 19. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Verse 20. Arise therefore, go down, go with them, dally nothing, for I have sinned. The Holy Spirit, he said, speaking. 
That's Pentecost. Peter's preaching and he talks about the Holy Spirit anointing Jesus. This same chapter, 1038, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. So here we have the Holy Spirit speaking. We have the Holy Spirit anointing. And while Peter was preaching, uh, it said the Holy Spirit fell upon him. Acts 10, 44, Peter was still speaking these words. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those that were there. And then he goes on and said the Holy Spirit was poured out, verse 45, because the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the Gentiles also. 46, for we heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So here is the Spirit speaking. The Spirit anointed, the Spirit fell, and then the Spirit was poured out. And Peter declares, receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 47, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Acts 11, 12, the Spirit told me. Acts 11, 15, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts 11, 16, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Think of all of these statements, and we're going to look at this for just a few minutes, but here the Spirit of God is orchestrating what's going to become this incredible move of God to the Gentiles. That's Pentecost. Spirit speaking. Spirit leading. Spirit falling. Spirit poured out. Spirit anointed. Is that you? Barnabas was sent. Revival broke out, and so Peter has to go. They send Barnabas. And the Bible says one of the reasons they sent him because he was full of the Holy Spirit. Acts 11 24. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Agabus, uh, he was shown by the Spirit. In other words, uh, here's a man there, he's a prophet. Acts 11 28. Uh, then one of them named Agabus stood up. Showed by the Spirit there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, and they took these offerings. Now think of this. Think the Spirit showed him the future. They chose the man because he was full of the Holy Spirit to come and minister. The Spirit's falling, it's being poured out, it's speaking, he's speaking. Is that, are you Pentecostal? Do you experience that the Spirit of God speak to you? Leads you? Are you sensitive? Remember what I said? Pentecostals are sensitive to the Spirit of God. Do you hear this voice in the Spirit? So how does that prayer should make you sensitive to the Holy Spirit? When you pray, do you ever stop and listen for the Spirit to speak? Come on. Come on. Or are you just putting up requests and petitions? And those are wrong. But do you ever, I've told you for years, I wake up early in the morning, sometimes I'll just lay there and say, God, speak to me. God, speak to me. God, speak to me. I want to hear your voice. And I may quote a few Christian scriptures and any man like wisdom may have asked God to pray if not be a deliverer to those things. God, speak to me. Both of these men who are key players, two chapters given to this revival, were men that it recorded their prayer. 
Cornelius, Acts 10 to a man who prayed to God always. And he has a vision, an angel stands there. Acts 10 4, again, Cornelius, your prayers and your alms have come up a memorial before God. <clears throat> Acts 10 30, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me, bright clothing. Verse 31, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are given. Remember the sight of God. Sit there for the job of the house on Here is a man who's praying. Always he says. That's a more Pentecostal people pray. Is that one of your distinctives? He said, I want you to sin for Peter. Think of what the Spirit says. I don't want you to sin for John. I don't want you to sin for James. The Spirit was so specific. One of the greatest blessings of life. Listen to me I'm, I'm for just a few moments. I'm trying to close. One of the greatest blessings in life is making the right call to the right person. When God wants to move in your life. He said, I want you to call Peter. I told him where he was at. He's down in John. Sign of the Tanner's house. You can't just call anybody. This is where I believe a lot of people miss destiny. They miss these divine appointments. They miss these divine connections with people who God has designed to be a blessing, to bring a dimension of God into their life. They miss it because they call the wrong person. They call people who don't pray. They call friends and family who are not spiritual and don't pray. He calls Peter. Where was Peter? Peter was praying. Paul Campbell had a stroke a number of years ago. Some of you know him, pastor and leader of the East Coast. He told his wife, told his church, he said, Pastor Campbell's going to come and pray for me and I'm going to be healed. I was scheduled to go back there. I was going to do a Bible conference. I didn't know any of this. And I went to the hospital and his son-in-law, I believe, was the assistant. I went to the hospital and he said, Joe, God told me you're going to come and pray for me. Pray for him. He rose up back. He's preaching pastor today. Pentecostal people in their prayers God hears. He heard from Moses' prayer and begin to orchestrate people that are going to be critical his whole family getting saved. His whole household. The Bible says, Acts 10, 9, Peter went up to the house top to pray. It was about the sixth hour. In biblical times, that would have been noon time. At noon, he's praying. And God prepared him. I won't waste time on the sheet and all that, but He prepares Peter for his <laughs> Prayer prepares you for people you wouldn't expect. Prayer prepares you for people that you wouldn't normally relate to. Prayer prepares you for people with needs that you normally wouldn't even be aware of or even think about. He's on the housetop praying. 
he's prejudiced, he's racial, he's Jewish. You know, so when she comes down, take an eat. And he won't do it. He said, my no unclean things never cross these lips. And God said, don't you call unclean when I come on. And so listen to Peter. He goes with his men. When he arrives at Cornelius' house, Acts 10.28, he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Verse 29. Therefore I come without objection as soon as I was sent for. God showed me in prayer. That I needed to be here. Prayer makes these divine connections. Some have said this is the last sermon ever recorded that Peter preached. You know, he wrote first and second Peter. Some say this is the last recorded sermon that he ever preached. And what is, I mean, he's preaching and the Holy Spirit fall. They were all saved. They were all baptized. Uh, filled with the Holy Ghost in this incredible revival of God. If you don't pray, very likely you will miss some of the most exciting, the most blessed God moments of your life. Pentecostals pray and are waiting and anticipating God to speak and move. If you pray, God will speak to you. I want you to witness to this person. I want you to tell this person about me. God will make just these contacts with people and you have nothing in common but there's a divine connection. And the next thing you know, you're ministering, praying, triggered this incredible revival of the Gentiles. Have you ever wondered how many times you may have missed a God moment because you didn't pray or listen for the Holy Spirit? These men are just playing my clothes. In my mind, it's not like they were expecting this to happen. Right? I mean, Peter goes up to pray. He's not expecting this whole sheep thing and God is speaking to him. And Gentiles knocking on his door. I mean, he, it's not like he's writing the script. Now I'm going to go down here. And how, he was amazed when he got to permit the house was filled. And he just kind of starts a sermon. Wouldn't that be exciting? I get up here Sunday morning and just start to preach about the birth of Christ. The <coughs> Spirit of God falls and just people laying on the floor. People running to the altar. Uh, people ripping tattoos off their ears or whatever. <laughs> I'm messing with you. Uh, I mean, this, this thing's wild. That's Pentecost. That's Pentecost. Sensitive, expecting, contending, waiting. We sing the courses. Come, Holy Spirit, fall of us. But do we really live in the I ask you about your pen with me this evening. You're here tonight before we do anything else. You're saved because the Spirit of God convicts you. The Bible says no man can come to God except the Spirit draws him. Draws him. That's a powerful thought. 
You're here tonight. You're here. You're unsaved. It's because the Spirit of God ushered you into this place. And may have used people. Someone may have invited you. But you ever just have a thought? You ever be talking to somebody? I remember Huggin talking about he's witnessing to this family that he's working. And, and they said, you know what? We've just been talking about what you're telling us. That's the Spirit of God. Spirit, you're here tonight. Salvation to be born again is such an incredible thing. Staggers me. Staggers my mind. When you repent, God, I'm sorry. I messed up. I don't know what I'm doing. Stumbling through life. Life going up. Oh, God, 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 can you... Can you forgive me? And one prayer of repentance changes you, your future, your whole world. It's called being born again. You get slow. You're here tonight. You say, Pastor, that's me. I need to pray that prayer. You lift your hand. Lift it up that I can see it. That's me. That's me. I need to pray that prayer. I'm not right with God. I looked it up that I can see. I see your hands. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Who else? Who else? That's me. Backslider. Come to church every Sunday night. Our church kids. Part of the summer. Come to church. But you're not clean. You're not saved. You're not living right. Oh, you know how to act and how to behave the courses. You need to come home. You lift your hand, probably son, daughter, you lift your hand and join me. Anyone else? That's me, Pastor. That's me. That's me you're talking to. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. I want you to your you lifted your hand. Would you come up out of your seat? Come and find a place to pray. You lifted your hand. Would you come? Distinctive of Pentecost. I want to ask you to stand your feet with me. Front to back, side to side. I want to open these altars. Are you led by the Spirit? Do you set your mind on the things of the Spirit or on the things of the flesh? Are you sensitive to the Spirit? Can God speak to you? Through His Spirit. Are you on the house of God praying in the time? Are you praying always like when you scratch your seat, you may be seated? I'm telling you, we're our Pentecostals. We love the presence of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We live for the Spirit. to interfere or interrupt our relationship with God and His Spirit. We're Pentecostal. Oh, God, you can hold on the ball of flesh now. Thank you. 
God, when you're full of the Spirit of God, so many things that take up, you, you, you don't even blink. You don't even get it. It's not even a, a temptation. It's not, it's not something that catches you. I encourage you. Let's not just get up here and say, we're going to cross the church. Let's be Pentecostal. Let's be good. Let's be praying. Praying. Laying hold of God. Christmas season is an incredible time uh, to witness. Some of you, you'll have family that you may not see all year. You'll, you'll have people at, at work a lot of times. God will open doors in your place of business, schools. God will open the door uh, that you... you like to some of these things are talking about when you like to see an angel tonight sure hey wake up I'm gonna talk to you <laughs> book of Acts has no end because it's still being written you and I are the book of Acts of 2020 should be 21 I was just lift your hands. Let's just begin to give God praise. Oh, Lord, I'm going to shout out. Thank you. 